Well, I want to welcome you all to tonight's event, Political and Social Unrest, a roundtable on the current Brazilian crisis, sponsored by the Brazil Initiative and the Department of Portuguese and Brazilian Studies. My name is James Green, and I'm the director of the Brazil Initiative and a professor of Brazilian history and culture at Brown University. And first of all, I would like to thank Ramon Stern for organizing this event. As always, Ramon has been a key person in guaranteeing that all of our activities sponsored by the Brazil Initiative are a tremendous success. And he deserves a round of applause. There he is. Um, for quite some time, Brown University has been a leader in promoting and developing Brazilian studies in the United States. And the most recent contribution to the field has been to host the Secretariat of the Brazilian Studies Association for the next five years. We will be also organizing Braza's 13th International Conference that will be held at Brown March 31st and April uh, 1st and 2nd, 2016. And we hope many of you will return from your spring break early to join us at the Braza Conference. Um, and although we understand that the current economic crisis in Brazil and government budget cuts and uh, the high exchange rate might mean that less of our uh, members from uh, Brazil will be able to join us, we still think that uh, the conference will be a very important contribution to our goal of promoting and developing Brazilian studies in the United States. So the idea for tonight's panel was suggested by Professor Luis Valente here. Um, at a meeting of the professors, the staff who work on the Brazil Initiative, asking us to organize an event to consider what the current political situation is in Brazil, and we want to thank him for proposing this event tonight. So what I'm going to do is to try to present a very brief 10-minute overview of the current political, economic, social situation in Brazil, which is impossible to do, and then um, uh, allow uh, our, I will introduce our panelists, and then each of them will speak for 15 minutes on their understanding or their take or their opinions on the current uh, questions and issues that are facing uh, Brazil. And we'll be finishing at 8 o'clock tonight. We have a two-hour event. Um, I apologize there's no uh, reception afterward. We should have thought of that. Uh, <laughs> would have kept people happier later. But we didn't think of that, so there's no reception tonight. Um, so since the <coughs> exit of the military uh, government in Brazil, in 1985. The country has gone through many bumpy years of the 1980s with hyperinflation and the impeachment of uh, President Gualo Jumelo in 1992 until, uh, who was the first democratically elected president in 1989. And I, but I would argue that there has been since then a consolidation of democracy in the country. A constitutional change allowed President Fernando Cardoso to assume a second term, a four-year term. He was succeeded by Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, a former trades union leader, representing a, a left-center coalition led by the Workers' Party, followed after a two-year term, followed by Jim Husefi, uh, now at the end of the first year of her second term in office. Now, during Lula's government, Brazil benefited from a very highly favorable international economic situation where the high demand of Brazilian exports helped fuel and grow the economy. And in that context, Brazil, the government, built upon some previously developed social programs under the Cardozo administration, consolidated some of them and expanded others uh, creating a series of social network uh, programs and uh, uh, investments in the country that made uh, Lula's government immensely popular in spite of a series of uh, scandals that uh, erupted in the, the end of his first term, known as the Mensalão scandals, basically kickbacks to politicians in order to get their vote in Congress, in which Lula himself was not uh, um, uh, damaged and was able to be uh, re-elected uh, for a second term. And at the time, uh, Brazil was seen uh, by the economists and observers as part of the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, really taking off and doing quite well. Lula, in fact, left office in, um, 
I think the, what the most popular president since uh, uh, 1889, when the republic was established, and I would argue probably equal as an iconic figure to Getulio uh, uh, Vargas in terms of his importance and impact on the country. At the time he left office, we can say if that's changed today, and certainly Dom Pedro II as a kind of iconic figure of, in the history of Brazil. And again, this could change in the future, but as he left office, this certainly seemed to be his position. And so, Dilma Rousseffi, a former revolutionary who was Lula's Minister of Mines and Energy, and then later his uh, Chief of Staff um, uh, after the Mensalão scandal, uh, was the appointed hand-picked successor, uh, and um, she managed to beat out uh, her opponents. Uh, first, uh, a surprising surge of Marina da Silva, Maria Silva, who was uh, uh, the environmental minister under uh, 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 Lula's uh, first government, and then uh, challenging uh, um, Jose. S she got 19 percent of the vote, but and then in the second round of the elections, Jose uh, Serra of the center right coalition uh, being defeated, and Juma taking a first f four tier, uh, years in office with a 56 to 44 uh, victory. Uh, and uh, then uh, for the first period of her time in office, she had very high ratings and favorability and seemed to be a different style than Lula, but a person that was uh, keeping a continuity of the programs that Lula had developed under his uh, two four-year terms. Um, and then in, uh, in, 19, uh, in 2013, um, a series of demonstrations erupted, initiated actually earlier in Porto Alegre in the south around the question of uh, fares for buses and public transportation, inspired by the World Social Forum, a grassroots idea of organizing rank and file and grassroots organizations, but really taking form in Sao Paulo when a group of students fighting and others fighting for um, free public transportation <coughs> uh, organized some demonstrations, the police repressed them, and this exploded nationally, combined with protests against the uh, expenses the government was making in building the stadiums for the World Cup in 2014. And these uh, the demonstrations in 2013, the June mobilizations, had a very peculiar characteristic in that, in general, although it was extremely eclectic, the demands seemed to have been we believe in the promises of this government. We want them to fulfill them by increasing investment in public transportation, health, and education. So in general, it was a pro-government or a pro this approach to government demonstration in 2013, combined with criticisms of government priorities, which exploded uh, and wobbled the government. And since that moment, Jilma's popularity declined, and she was not able to regain it. Uh, in 2014 until the contested election. So we have um, Brazil's successful carrying out of the uh, World Cup with very few snafus, although everyone predicted it would be a disaster, and it wasn't. But there was a disaster, which was Brazil's defeat uh, in the World Cup and a demoralization. And then the election campaign in which, uh, again, Marina Silva it's, uh, at one moment seems to be a strong candidate. She ends up being the candidate of one party. But then in the final cont contested election, uh, Jilma will represent a center-left coalition uh, going against a center-right coalition and will win by uh, 3.5 million votes, but is the narrowest victory in an election in the second round of an election since 1989 when uh, Kola won by a six-point lead over Lula in the first democratic presidential election since 1960. And so, Jilma, soon thereafter, in order to, um, during the campaign, had promised that she was not going to change the policies of her government, economic or social policies, that she was going to defend them. Very soon thereafter, appointed a relatively conservative minister of finance, arguably to assure the investment uh, sector of the economy, appointed uh, a representative of um, the agribusiness to the Ministry of Agriculture, immediately causing a crisis among her base of support, singing, why are you appointing someone we've been fighting against for many years? Why is this person carrying out an austerity plan when we thought you were going to continue these government policies? Uh, coupled by um, uh, a, a drastic cut in government spending um, and uh, because of uh, fears that Brazil's ranking uh, will be uh, reduced in uh, international ratings and the increase in inflation. And so today, academics, 
are, are facing severe cuts in financial support, which might mean that many of our colleagues might not be able to come to our conference. But the, in general, there's an increase in inflation and a general notion that there's a malaise in the economy as growth has declined. Um, so in this context, also there erupts something that was percolating before the election, the second round of the second term of Joma's office, but uh, revelations thereafter about gross corruption within the state-owned oil industry, uh, oil company Petrobras, in which uh, executives were making credible uh, sacking of the of the resources of the of this uh, iconoclast, this uh, this very important institution. Uh, uh, in Brazil, a symbol of nationalism and progress and development, and also a series of investigations on people who were involved in a series of corruption scandals linked to members of uh, the current government. Um, and this provokes in, in, in 2014, uh, 2014 uh, then another series of mobilizations by the center right calling for Dilma's impeachment, uh, accusing her of being uh, uh, connected to these corruption scandals, and then also accusing her of um, not being honest in the way she's presenting the, the federal bu uh, the budget and therefore violating a, a regulation that the Congress must approve her budget. Um, these mobilizations, which occurred in 2014 and 2015, uh, grow in size and then decrease in size, and their component in general are, if I, I think this is a very fair representation uh, based on uh, Folha de São Paulo, who is not that necessarily friendly with this current government of generally people of the middle and upper middle class who are college educated and have more income, although there's a diversity of people in these demonstrations, calling for many things, but generally for the impeachment of Gilma with a smaller sector calling for um, the, um, uh, the intervention of the military in Brazil to solve their problems. And I think people in the panel will uh, talk about that tonight. So we have a situation where the economy is optimistic and then it seems the economy is taking a nosedive as reflected in two uh, issues of The Economist. Um, and then the problems that Gilma faces, and I, I think uh, several of our panelists are going to be discussing this, one is that while she has a theoretical majority in the Congress, her main coalition partner, the Brazilian Democratic uh, uh, Brazilian Democratic Movement uh, <coughs> Party is, um, is led by a sector which is no longer supporting the government. And the Speaker of the lower house of the <coughs> Congress, a man named Eduardo Cunha, um, who is an evangelical Christian and is very critical of Dilma, had led an effort to try to impeach her in Congress, but now is facing his own problems because he has, it's been revealed that he's been involved in multi-million dollar corruption scandals and having Swiss bank accounts and siphoning money and misusing uh, government funds. And it, today I understand that the, the major center-left party, the Brazilian Social Democratic Party, uh, has withdrawn its support for Cunha. So the efforts that he has tried to lead to impeach Gilma seem to not, um, don't seem to be able to take place. Uh, in addition, another very complex part of this process has been federal prosecutors investigating corruption uh, and in an unprecedented way, uh, jailing chief executive officers of major construction companies who have done biddings to get contracts with the government, putting into prison uh, the son, for example, of the Odebrecht, which is one of the largest Brazilian companies. Uh, he becomes uh, an informer in a plea bargaining agreement to Im imply other people. And so there's been a cascading of accusations against different people who have been negotiating with the government to get contracts to do major works projects, and it's not clear where and when this will end. And so we have a situation in which Gilma may or may not survive her second term, and I predict personally, and I've done a bad job in the past, if people recall, <laughs> so just take this in stride, that the 2018 elections will be an election in which in the first round there'll be at least 12 political candidates, somewhat like the Republican Party in the sense that there's so many of them, there, although the ideology will be different, in, uh, in that all of the political parties will need to promote a strong candidate. Lula may or may not be able to survive that long to be a candidate. He can come back to be reelected. And then there will be a runoff where it could be that the two top candidates have 18 and 20 percent of the population vote for that runoff. So then the big fight will be how can the two candidates 
build a coalition around the 28 plus political parties to get their support, to get them over the top, to have a majority in the second round of the elections. But so much is going to happen between now and then that this is a prediction which is probably absolutely irrelevant. So tonight we're going to talk about a Brazil. We can say it's maybe damaged or it's not. I like that image. It was a different image of Brazil I wanted to put up. I want to introduce our four panelists. We wanted to do this differently. Generally, it's been a 90 de Janeiro, Luis Valencia, Jim Green making their comments on these elections things, so we wanted you're to shake still, it up. You're bring still a, doing it. I'm still doing it because I earn it, because I work very hard for the Brazil Initiative. And I will let everyone speak tonight to share their opinions. There will be a democratic forum. But we wanted to have four people, um, and I tried to be objective. Is that possible? Um, we have four uh, people that will be speaking. I want to introduce them in the order they'll be speaking. Silvia Cabral Teresa is from Sao Paulo and a doctoral student in the Department of Portuguese and Brazilian Studies. Moisés Costa is also from Sao Paulo and is a doctoral student in political science. Uh, Mila Burns, who hails from Rio de Janeiro, is, a, is the anchor of Global uh, Notícias América, of Global News uh, International. So she's like our media person tonight, and is also a doctoral student in history, uh, Latin American history at CUNY. And finally, Joaquin Aldo Ferreira, born in Bahia but raised in Rio, is the Vasco da Gama Professor of History and Portuguese and Brazilian Studies at Brown University. So the rules of the game are each one is going to speak for 15 minutes, and then we're going to open it up for comments, questions, uh, let people speak, accumulate some questions, and let the people on the panel respond. Uh, if they would like to, and then we'll do another round and we'll continue uh, talking until we leave at 8 o'clock. So I want to ask Sylvia if she would join us. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jim, for the introduction, and good evening, everyone. I need to start with a disclaimer. I'm not a political scientist, a historian, or an economist, so I was very surprised and happy to be invited to be on this panel. And what I can offer you here is some of my thoughts and perceptions of what's happening in Brazil through the lenses of a student and a citizen who has been following everything mainly through the media and by talking with friends and family that remain in Brazil. I cannot help but think that since 2013, everything in Brazil has become yet more complicated. Historical time seems to have accelerated in the country and there has been a fundamental change in our regime of visibility with the reorganization and strengthening of activism from various sectors of society that were unable to fit neatly into the overall framework of hegemonic progressive uh, thinking pre-2013. So far, if we compile the headlines of major newspapers in Brazil, and I think Mila Burns will speak in more detail about this, 2015 has been the year of the Operação Lava Jato, the Operation Car Wash, mm -hmm. of the economic crisis, and of the soap opera of the speculation around the impeachment. And all these amid a flurry of protests. It is important to notice that Brazil is not alone in terms of the political issue. We're seeing a global crisis of traditional systems of representative democracy as a result of corruption, which is simply more exposed because now people have more access to um, information and better organizational skills thanks to the internet. The Brazilian political system is struggling along the same lines as many other systems in the world. <coughs> Protests and attrition are wearing away at the <coughs> traditional political parties in addition to the appearance of, of populist currents of far right and far left wings. In Spain, Portugal, and Greece, for example, the reaction is from the left. In France, um, England, and Germany, it comes from the right. What then is causing this crisis? In my opinion, the simple yet extremely meaningful fact that citizens can no longer accept that their political power is restricted to one vote every four years. There is a chronic dissatisfaction with the entire political class. And this does not mean that people believe that all politicians are corrupt, 
but rather that there is a political class that is separate from citizenship, consisting of professionals whose common interest lies in a monopoly of political corruption. And this is the root of the problem in Brazil, but not only there. In recent years, we have seen the drowning of political systems in Italy, Spain, Greece, and we are now witnessing the same in Argentina and Mexico. It's something deeper. But what then is the specificity of Brazilian case? What is unfolding there is a perfect storm. The crisis of representation has gone hand in hand with a terrible worsening of the economic situation. After a strong period of growth with redistribution, as Dim um, spoke about, the slowdown in China for, as one of the reasons meant it became difficult to maintain the same high level of public spending. And then the inflation, which has seen, we already know has been seen as the cancer of the economy and the Brazilian society at other times, began rising again. At the time the current government realized that this was a possibility, it should have restricted public spending, but it did not. And everything started to deteriorate and became be even more visible. The wave of protests in Brazil is not a programmatic movement, but an emotional one, which arose spontaneously. And this initial outrage allowed the expansion of the movement's core issues. The word dignity is repeated everywhere. Why? Because the demands are not concrete, although there are concrete problems and practical problems. What people are asking for is recognition. At the slums or in skyscrapers, individuals no longer feel that the institution is representing them. The movement in 2013 was popular, skewed young, and set on concrete demands, but immediately raised the issue of dignity. And it succeeded because it annulled the increase in bus fare, even if just temporarily. And to some extent, President Dilma Rousseff connected with it. But the PT apparatus blocked the possibility of real reform. Now, in 2015, it is the middle and upper middle classes who are taking the streets. They have come to the point of demanding the impeachment of the president. I should say that the group asking for the coup is actually small, and the chances of their demands being met seem to me astronomical. But it is significant that there are people and politicians who want this and are voicing it. That's a huge transformation. The institution is clearly not capable of representing the diversity of this society. In Brazil, what exists now is a corrupt political class that uses the state for its own purposes. And it does this as a class, although as concrete individuals rulers, sometimes they do not. In Brazil, there is no rule of law. Instead, there is the manipulation of law to maintain a patrimonial state. And that is why I will now address one of the main points that have contributed to this extreme situation. And this section, I've called it one of the reasons the Chamber of Deputies. For those who don't know, the Chamber of Deputies in Brazil is a federal legislative body and the lower house of the National Congress. The Chamber comprises 513 deputies who are elected by proportional representation to serve four-year terms. The current president of the Chamber is the polemic and notorious Eduardo Cunha from PMDB Rio de Janeiro, third in line of the succession to the presidency of Brazil. The main target of the latest protests Cunha has against him the strong evidence of having committed tax evasion and capital flight to accounts in Switzerland. He is under investigation for allegedly having received bribes and for holding secret bank accounts in Switzerland containing around $2.4 million, uh, approximately 9.13 million reais. Opponents in social movements advocate for the opening of a process of impeachment against Cunha. One of the champions when it comes to votes in Rio de Janeiro he is regarded as a major business fundraiser for election campaigns, a rainmaker, a practice understood by many as the origin of political corruption in Brazil. And the number of conservative agendas that gained prominence in the chamber during Cunha's tenure is alarming. Those are agendas that do not help at all in the development of Brazil as a secular and less sexist state. Cunha's power today is greater than of the parliament itself, because by himself he would not have this strength, but right now he represents a group of deputies and some economic groups that have proposals such as the following, and I'm going to mention seven here briefly. PL means is a project for a new law. Cunha wrote this bill in 2013, and it's being voted on now. 
If it becomes a law, the text will criminalize the act of assisting or inducing a woman to abortion. It also prescribes that every rape victim is to be sent to a police station before receiving medical treatment so that a physical examination can provide proof of rape. Critics point out that this puts women's health at risk. After all, this would be like asking victims of other sorts of violence to go to a police station before being able to seek medical attention. And the text also um, categorizes as a heinous crime the, the day after pill. Then packing means that it's like an amendment to an already existing um, law. Approved by a special committee of the chamber, the proposal is waiting to be voted in plenary before it can go to the Senate. The text demands that churches have the power to challenge the Supreme Court, the highest body in Brazil's judiciary. Today, the only ones entitled to take this kind of actions are the President, the Attorney General of the Republic, the Federal Council of the Brazilian Bar Association, OAB, political parties represented in the Congress, trade union federations, professional associations, national wide, and legislative <laughs> committees. In a secular state, it remains a mystery to me why churches should enter the select list. Then we have, also written by Cunha, this bill that foresees the creation of a law criminalizing a heterophobia. In other words, he has been advocating and, be and he believes that people suffer some form of prejudice or violence because they feel attracted to some one of the opposite sex. It is important to note that in Brazil, homophobia is not a crime. Although there are records saying that one LGBT person dies every 28 hours in the country, and although Brazil has come in first in rankings of the countries that kill the most transsexuals. Another project of law proposing the criminalization of homophobia was filed in 2014 after spending eight years circulating in the Senate. <coughs> Then in September of this year, of 2015, a committee of the chamber approved this bill, which fixed the concept of a family as, and I quote, a social core formed from the union between a man and a woman through marriage or common law marriage, or through a community formed by either parent and their offspring, end of quote. The text then states that unions of homosexual couples or single parents or children raised by grandparents do not form a family. If made law, the rule may hinder benefits such as pensions for couples not covered uh, by the law. Then we have now the text written by Almir Sa, which provides that the power to demarcate indigenous lands passes from the executive branch to the Congress. The text was first approved by a special committee of the chamber. This happens a lot of a text being approved by a special committee uh, during Queen's tenure. And then you went to the plenary of the House. The proposal is highly criticized by indigenous groups who fear malfeasance by congressmen sympathetic to the larger fa farmers, the ruralistas, which makes a lot of sense since the Agriculture Caucus has 169 members right now. Then we have the proposal that has been active in the chamber since 1993, but could only be approved during Queen's mandate. The law changes the age of criminal responsibility from 18 to 16 years old in cases of heinous crimes such as murder, bodily injury, kidnapping, or rape. The issue has divided lawyers with critics arguing that in addition to not helping the recovery of the young detainee, this measure opens up to the possibility of extending the rule to other offenses in a few years. And lastly, in March of this year, the chamber approved a text that calls for changes in how GM products are identified on their packaging. The most important change was their complete removal of the GM symbol. The proposal pleased the ruralistas, the larger farmers, but it makes it harder for the public to access information. After all, there's still much debate about the effects of transgenic crops in human health. Why then, even as he is buried in allegations, has Eduardo Cunha been so bold in taking forward so many bills that make the country take 10 steps back in the development process? I think this is a huge topic we're going to discuss, but mainly because both the opposition, the government, and the press has been, have been supporting him in one of the most important positions in the country. I wonder how each of us will be remembered about this for this in the future. Probably, again, the voters of Fernando Collor will disappear. No one will take the blame. But then, and sadly, it will be too late for one or more than one entire generation. 
And speaking of future generations, I would like to leave you with a note about education, since the time is short, but this is very relevant and connects to everything that has been said. Among the many threats of setback that arise in Congress today, one of the most serious is focused on education. They scare the scarecrow of indoctrination of students by leftist teachers is a pretext for the criminalization of critical thinking in the classroom. Instead, we are returning to the outdated understanding of education as limited to the transmission of factual content for which the teacher is a mere reciter and the students an empty receptacle. The empty slogan of the movement, for example, school free of political parties, Escola Sem Partido, and I lost myself, uh, try to disseminate the idea that uncritical, think, uncritical teaching is neutral when, in fact, by naturalizing the existing world and inhib inhibiting discussions of its internal contradictions, is a powerful mechanism for the perpetuation of the status quo. There are several bills in Congress right now born of the consensus that there is an indoctrination effort in progress, be it from the PT or the left in general that are making schools into centers for the broadcasting of socialism and feminism. It is a reaction to the still insufficient rethinking of pedagogical practices, a reaction that did not start today, but that was intensified with the rightist offensive in recent years. It is a kind of paranoia that casts the alleged indoctrination as a state policy, which explains the hallucinations of movements such as this one, Escola Sem Partido, the repudiation of Paulo Freire in public right-wing pr protests, or the hysterical reaction to the recent topics featured on the NA. Is a national college admission? Is this question? It talks about feminism. We can discuss it. Mm -hmm. each, time, each time schools have moved away, however slightly, from their traditional role in the ideological apparatus as the reproducer of the social order, the flag of indoctrination has been risen. The spurious reasoning is obvious. Reproduction is easily accepted as non-ideological because the social order in place is naturalized. It's almost as if it is not the result of historical processes and social conflict with winners and losers, but a fact of reality that exists in itself. So with all that being said, and to conclude, 2015 has been a difficult year, depressing even. It's the year of this deep crisis of representation, the frightening power of Eduardo Cunha, and costly setbacks in education. And I didn't even get to talk about higher education. But I hope I do not leave you with a too pessimistic tone. I believe that there is always hope. And I think this hope is what is worth discussing with you in the end. So if you know anything about me, you know I like talking about Brazilian politics. So this is a, a big treat for me. So we've been talking a little bit about different sides of the crisis, and we know that there could be lots of uh, reasons for a crisis. And international media has been talking about the crisis as an economic matter. So let's take a look at a, a, a few numbers for Brazil. So last year, Brazil in GDP growth had basically 0% uh, percent of GDP growth. This year, the IMF predicts that Brazil will have a negative rate of 3%, and next year, a negative rate of 1%. If you look at uh, the, the rest of the world, Brazil is really going in the opposite direction. So I think it's safe to say that there is an economic crisis in Brazil. But is that really the biggest crisis that we have in Brazil? Earlier this week, Abidu Diniz, who is a uh, prominent businessman in Brazil, one of the richest men in the country, he said that it is not an economic crisis, but a political one. When we regain political stability, the turn in the economic situation will be swift because trust will be reestablished. And I think there's a lot of truth to what he's saying there. I do think that the crisis has in its roots the lack of trust, lack of trust in society, in the political sphere, lack of trust in the business community, in, the, in government as well. And I'd like to talk a little bit about that point. But if we're going to talk about 
po the political crisis in Brazil, it's impossible to talk about the party system. And I think that's where the biggest problem that we're having in Brazil lies. So if you know anything about the party system in Brazil, you know that in recent years, the system has been polarized between two parties. The PT, which is the governing party, and that's a center-left party, the Workers' Party, and the PSDB, which is a social democratic party, which is also a center-left party. And then along with those two parties, you have the PMDB, which is the <coughs> largest party in Congress, and they're a very centrist party, and they basically just follow whoever is in power. They were in power when PSDB was in government, they're in power when the, uh, when the PT is in government as well. Now, I said that the system is polarized amongst two uh, parties that are both in the center left, and I think that's very problematic. So what has happened in Brazil is that parties are not a way of bringing together different ideas and different values, but just different personalities. It's really a power struggle. And this creates a problem because there's no uh, viable uh, difference in the suggestions they're giving, they're bringing to Congress. So there's not really an alternative to the status quo. And I think people are getting a little tired of that. And there are over 30 parties in Congress in Brazil today. And the reason why we have so many parties is because we have a proportional representation system in order to represent all the interests in society. And if the system is polarized amongst two parties that are basically following the same uh, place in the political spectrum, I think that's uh, very problematic. But it's not all bad news. We have a new development where two new parties came into being the last uh, couple of months, and I think they will add a good uh, mix of the party system in Brazil. The first one is the Rede Sustentabilidade. This is Marina Silva's party, so Marina Silva was here not too long ago explaining a little bit about her party. And actually her platform, uh, it's not based on a class division, but it's based on uh, sustainable development. And not only that, but the actual party structure is very different than the traditional parties in Brazil. It's not a vertical hierarchical structure. It's based on a network uh, structure, and the uh, party members have a lot of voice in the direction the party takes. So I think that will bring a little uh, diversification in the party system. And then you have the Partido Novo, which is the newest party uh, in, in the Brazilian system, which came into being by a group of businessmen in Brazil that didn't think their interests were being represented by the current system. And their basic platform is to protect private property. It's also to uh, uh, have uh, smaller government and help with comp business competitiveness as an ease of business. So they come with a very different proposal than the traditional parties have. And not only that, but their party structure is also very different. So rather than having a vertical structure, they have a horizontal structure. And the president of the party, for example, cannot hold elected office, which is something that's not uh, a feature in any other party in Brazil. And party members have to contribute financially with the party, which also answers to a question of uh, party financing, which is something that's a big topic in Congress right now. So I think we can have a little bit of hope with, with uh, the new parties coming in, which differ from older uh, parties that were new entrants into the system, that they were basically just a reshuffle of old personalities into a new label just for the sake of power. Now, if we're talking about the political crisis in Brazil, as has already been discussed, it's impossible not to talk about Eduardo Cunha. So Eduardo Cunha, he was a very little known politician uh, up until the beginning of this year. He comes from the state of Rio, from the PMDB. And the way how he became prominent is that at the beginning of the year, right after Dilma won the election, she was facing some uh, 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 problems in distributing power because she had to distribute a lot of power in order to uh, be elected again. Uh, the PMDB, which is the largest party in Congress, already had the vice presidency and the presidency of the Senate. And they wanted also the presidency of the Chamber of Deputies, which is equivalent to the Speaker of the House in the U.S. Now, the PT would not give that to them, and a faction within the PMDB got upset about that. And Eduardo Cunha was able to capitalize in that uh, division within the party and gain support from the opposition parties, and he was actually elected by a, a good margin into uh, being the Speaker of the House. Now, this is significant, not because he's there, but because of what he's doing. So traditionally, the Speaker of the House has not had a big role in politics in Brazil. The uh, party politics in Brazil has been uh, a closed doors business, really. The executive really dominated Congress, and discussions in Congress weren't really very significant to whoever was actually trying to learn things about the political system. Now, Eduardo Cunha changed that, because he's actually going against government, and he has his own agenda and he's pushing it forward, like uh, we just heard about some of his uh, points, which actually do 
translating to the interests of a, a large portion of the population. And he gained a lot of prominence because of that. And not only that, but he's actually doing things by the book. So uh, as I talked to a lot of congressmen in Brazil, all of them seem to think that Cunha is really an expert on the regiments of the House. And what he did is he took actually two years before he became a candidate to the Speaker of the House to really learn the regiments and how the institution works. And he's actually doing things by the book. And that's actually how he's able to gain so much power. And I think this is going to set a precedent to how the House works going forward. So I think this is actually a positive thing uh, that's coming out of the crisis. Unfortunately, he's now involved in a lot of uh, uh, scandals and he will probably have to step down. And the, op the main opposition party, the PSDB, today already declared that they're uh, 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 withdrawing their support for Cunha, and this will be a problem for him. And what this also means is that he's actually running to President Dilma for her protection, and which means that he will stop fighting against her. So this will change the dynamics there. Now, if the Congress has lost a lot of respect, the judiciary in Brazil, on the other hand, has gained actually a lot of respect by the population. And the judiciary is, is one of the branches in government that has been seen as ineffective in the past. But in the last couple of years, they've actually gained a lot of support. And these two judges here, that I'll talk a little bit about them, have become national heroes. The first one, Joaquim Barbosa, he was, respons he was the, the uh, president of the Supreme Court in Brazil up until last year. And he was responsible for the Ming Salon case, which we heard a little bit that Jim talked about. And this was a case where uh, a, a scheme for vote buying, uh, specifically uh, uh, with public monies going to the PT uh, mainly, uh, he actually put a lot of people in jail. So the, the guy with the biggest picture there on the side, these are all people that he put in jail, was José Dirceu. And José Dirceu was the chief of staff for President Lula. And he was really the second in command in PT after Lula. And this is the person, right, that you don't ever think you would see in jail. And he was actually prosecuted and put in jail. And all those other politicians there are in jail. And they have stayed in jail, so no political interference in that process. The other one is Sergio Moro. Sergio Moro is a, a judge from the state of Paraná, and he's currently judging the Lava Jato operation or the Petrolon uh, scandal, which deals with also uh, 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 corruption, uh, money laundering, uh, using uh, the Petrobras, the state oil company, and going to private companies and to public individuals, like Eduardo Cunha, for example. And he's actually putting a lot of very powerful people in jail as well. And not only politicians, but actually strong businessmen from the largest uh, business conglomerates in Brazil. And this is very significant uh, to the Brazilian system. And not only that, but the federal police has actually gained a lot of support. And they've actually shown a lot of independence in their investigations and all these corruption scandals. And it's actually strengthening their standing. And they've actually been able to do these investigations to the point that Lula's son, that's the uh, person there in the bottom picture, was actually arrested last week with, for involvement in a big uh, scandal as well. So this is something that was unthinkable a year ago, right? And his son actually got arrested. And the cases are getting closer and closer to President Lula and uh, uh, President uh, Duma, which is something that they've always been able to uh, avoid in the past. So I think this is very significant about the crisis. But we cannot talk about the crisis without talking about President Duma, who's facing impeachment. Uh, an impeachment process. Now, President Juma, she lost a lot of support, as I said, uh, at, the, at the end of last year. At, about at this time of the year, last year, we were discussing whether or not she would win the election. She won, but she lost a lot of power, which meant that she had to distribute a lot of power amongst her uh, base. She uh, had 39 ministries in order to distribute all of that uh, support, which made it very hard for her to govern. And her position was very weakened because of that. And she especially had to give power to small parties that really had no expression and she got uh, uh, hostage by, by those parties. But just so that you understand a little bit how bad is her situation currently, so this is her approval rates during her first term, right? So the, uh, this is a survey that asks how people would rate her government. So the blue line, which is at the top one there, says uh, people were responding that her government was actually doing a good job. The gray line is that her job was, that, that her government was mediocre, and the red line at the bottom is people saying that her government was bad. Right? So you see that there in 2013, you see a big dip in her approval rate. And this is when the popular protests began. And she was not able to recuperate that after that. Now, if we look at her second term, this is this year, people saying that her government is bad is at 71% of the population. Right? And only about 8% of the population thinks that she's doing a good job in government. Now, this is very bad. And just so you have a comparison basis here, when President Collor was impeached in 1992, right? So this is probably the darkest moment we have in our recent democratic history. 
This is his approval rate. It was at 68% of people saying that his government was bad. Dilma was today 71%, right? And about 9% of people said that his government was good at the time of his impeachment, right? So this is when we had all the evidence saying that he was completely corrupt and all of the things that he was doing, and that's where his approval rate is. Now, having said all of that, is it all bad news? And I think not. I think that the political system in Brazil has faults, but the institutions are solid. So all the processes that we're seeing related to the crisis, they have been done within the institutional boundaries of the system. Now, there are parts of the system that need to be uh, reformed. And Cunha actually put forward uh, uh, an attempt to do that with the political reform earlier this year, but because of uh, other power struggles, and especially because of that lack of alternative to the center left or left side of politics, there was really no other alternative to uh, the current system. And they actually benefit from the system, so there was no incentive for them for changing that. So I think if we're able to reform specific sectors of the government, we're actually able to uh, move the uh, process forward. But the institutions are strong, and I think that's very positive. And the judiciary gained a lot of power, which is also very positive. So I think as we discuss the crisis today, we, th we should be aware that the, the crisis is not all bad. I think it's actually doing some positive changes to the system itself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Com certeza. Ele foi, ele foi preso. Eu foi que o Globo, inclusive, negou que ele foi mencionado. Não, ele foi. Às 11 da noite foram na casa dele e levaram ele à força. Que dia é isso? Semana passada. Você viu que o. Que ele, o Globo... ele não ficou preso, ele não ficou preso. Não, então ele foi, de... ele foi levado a ser intim... assim, intimado, ele até foi. Ele sim, não foi preso. Sim, aí, aí, não, é aí... bem diferente. Tudo bem, mas ele foi pra, é. foi pra delegacia. Tudo bem, mas pra é delegacia. bem diferente. Tá bom. É preciso... Tudo bem. É que em inglês, a Vestry, você é levado os três anos. Yeah. Levado just três. making a quick correction before I start. I, my friend here just said that Lula's son was arrested, and I was checking the information because I didn't hear about that. Actually, what I heard two days ago were, was O Globo, a newspaper actually from the network I work for. I work for TV Globo, uh, mentioning that they committed a huge mistake, saying that Lulinha, Lula's son, was uh, denounced in one of the Lava Jato uh, uh, operations by one of these people who are now, you know, voluntarily pointing fingers and pointing to all the culpable people. Uh, and, and actually, Oglobo said they were wrong and he was not cited. Uh, he was not arrested from my understanding. You can Google it and I'm maybe wrong too. But my understanding is that he was taken to into custody. I think that's the word in English, right? Custody. Question. And he was questioned, but he was not arrested, but that's just me, so I might be wrong too. Well, uh, my name is Mila Burns, I'm a journalist and I'm also a, about to be a historian. And um, I'm using this name for my presentation, Our Brand is Crisis, because I think I'll jump into what my friends just presented here, but I'll also talk a little bit about perception. That's going to be my focus here. Uh, Moises uh, just mentioned that Abilio Diniz talked about a, a political crisis in Brazil instead of an economic crisis. And I think this is also a crisis of perception as well, of how we perceive the government and how we perceive the crisis itself. Uh, we all know that public perception matters, but we all know that it's also a struggle for us to define public perception. How can I point to that? How can I measure that for real? And uh, I count on you to be understanding and know that Measuring perception is also part of my perception as a citizen and as a journalist, so you may disagree. Uh, but as we all know, public perception is able to create heroes and to create villains, to create enemies and friends. And I will talk about that and about how the media and social media interpretations of the current moment affect that. To start, I think that crisis itself is a very, very attractive concept. There's a reason why there's a movie with this name, this very same name uh, showing now. Crisis is something that, for, for me as a journalist, is something that will call your attention. If I say, yeah, we're just, you know, surfing in a wave of greatness, yeah, okay, that's nice. But crisis is something that really matters. And we know that in U.S. history, from Johnson uh, campaigning with fear, we know how powerful the idea of fear or crisis is. 
that's not to say that there's no crisis in Brazil. On the contrary, I think you saw the numbers here and, uh, and that Moisés and Silvia pointed to. But a few things that we know about the moment, also jumping on what they said, is that it is worse than anyone could expect a year or two ago, much worse. It's not as uh, anyone uh, uh, assumed it would be. It is really problematic in terms of the economy, but also in terms of the political crisis. Another thing we know is it's very, very unstable. So I remember calling my mom and saying I would be here for this talk in November and saying I have to prepare. This was early, early September, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, she said, don't do that. You're losing your time. You're wasting time because everything is changing every other day. So if you prepare now, you're going to face a new reality by November. She might be, not be the president anymore. Uh, a coup may happen. And my mom with this 1960s mind is like always frightening about a new coup. And um, no, nothing like that happened. But yes, it is very unstable and things are changing every day. Another thing is, as building again on what Abilio Genie said, nobody can tell exactly where the political crisis starts and where the economic crisis starts. We have both, but it's very hard for us to have a clear dimension on how much the political situation is affect, affecting the economic situation and the economic situation is affecting the political situation uh, as well. But another thing we know is that institutions in Brazil are working and are working independently from the executive, which is something that may seem pretty obvious for you uh, in the United States, but it's not obvious for us. It, it's been quite some time in which the federal, uh, uh, our FBI, our version of FBI, the Polícia Federal in Brazil, did not do its job, in a, you know, in se separated from the executive. It's been, it, we've never seen a judiciary as independent from the executive government or a, a deputies chambers as uh, independent. So institutions are working. Uh, all we know for sure um, among this unstable uh, <coughs> moment is that the political climate is aggravating the economic crisis. This is something we all agree. And that the current moment is one in which Dilma is hated by groups by, of the left wing and by groups of the right wing. I, I couldn't help but thinking of Salvador Allende, and I know it's, it's my topic of the topic of my research, but I could, couldn't help but thinking of that. The radical left saying you abandoned us, measures of austerity are not what we, we didn't choose you for that, and at the same time right wing saying, well, we've always hated you and we still hate you even more now. Uh, but the current moment is, is, a, is a moment of division. So I'll talk about this aspect, the aspect of the perception of the crisis. Um, so just for, to make clear, yes, we have a crisis. Sorry for having this in Portuguese, but this is, this is what I did before. So. But if you look at the second mandate of uh, Fernando Henrique Cardoso and the first mandate at, of Dilma, the difference is not that big. I didn't include the second one because, of course, it's not over. But you saw the numbers with Moisés. Things got really ugly this year. So the situation in the second mandate, it's probably the second term is probably going to be much, much worse than what we're seeing over there uh, in comparison to other governments. But this is not something super unique for Brazil. Uh, those of you who are from Brazil and those of you who are in your 30s, maybe you remember the 80s when you know our parents would rush with us to the supermarket to buy whatever they could within an hour because the, one hour later someone would be there mar remarking the prices and things would be changing every time, every second precisely. I remember my dad driving me to the gas station at night and sleeping. I was sleeping in the back of the, uh, uh, in the the sit in the in the back of the car, and he would be driving because prices would you know increase the day after. So, but never in any case, it is a huge crisis. Another thing that many of the uh, leftists who support Dilma forget to mention is that yes, there is unemployment is also uh, increasing, which is probably one of the biggest uh, victories <coughs> of the uh, PT government in Brazil. Uh, you know, reducing unemployment in Brazil, yes, it is increasing in 2015. We all acknowledge that and we know uh, this is a problem. However, something that I think it's tricky is that at the same time, I just read a, a The Economist, actually, let me go back to Fernando Henrique. I don't know if you read, uh, it, it was this week's Bellows column and, uh, and he wrote about 
Fernando Henrique as this big hero who is now coming back and uh, was so criticized in his second term, but he was really, really affected during his second term by the international crisis, which is very different from the situation that Dilma is facing now, right? So not necessarily. I really feel that in terms of media coverage in Brazil, there's a lack of coverage on the international crisis. And we're looking a lot at what's happening in Brazil. And I, I can make a mea culpa here as a member of the media. Again, crisis is a good brand. It's something that really calls people's attention. And national crisis is also something that really calls you. If I'm talking to you about what's happening in your neighborhood, it's very different from telling you what the Greeks are going through. Who are the Greeks again? Plateau? Oh, okay, I think I can relate to that, right? It's something that it's really, really far away. It's not something that's happening in your neighborhood. So the perception of the crisis also affects that. For instance, this is the Pew Institute research uh, uh, made of, I think, uh, November, uh, yeah, spring 2015. This is just part of it, but the central question was, what worries you the most in the world today? And uh, among the options were, was, were the international crisis, uh, prejudice, racial issues, things like that, and global warming. In Latin America, global warming was number one, not international crisis. And you may ask, whoa, but with everything that we're seeing in Brazil and what our friends talked about now, how come people are worried about global warming? I know it's a big, big deal, but if people are not going to the streets to demonstrate for global warming, not in Brazil. In New York they are, but they're not in Brazil. They're going to the streets to demonstrate against the government. So what is happening there? And I think that what is happening is precisely in this lack of uh, attention to the crisis as an international thing and not necessarily as something that uh, is a national problem. In October, another research, and it's not there, it's from KPMG, uh, uh, mentioned that they interviewed 300 uh, businessmen and they actually agreed with uh, Billy Genie saying that Brazil was the third best country in the moment for investments. Although we know that investments are not in a good moment in international, uh, uh, external investments are not in a good moment in Brazil. But they said that it's still a, a country that in, in which they believe. Uh, I think Sylvia also mentioned that. So this is just a map for you to see uh, the level of concern. And you're going to note that Brazil, even in comparison to other countries of Latin America, is the country where uh, these people are the most worried about global warming. However, when they ask about the economic mood in your nation, in your country, we are really doing bad. The perception is Brazil is really going terribly. Uh, this is among uh, advanced emerging and developing economy in general, and in these charts you can see the perception of Brazil. And we're ha right here among the emerging nations, right? So only above uh, Lebanon and U Ukraine, right? It's, it's really uh, something that it's in my opinion, is very impressive. That's how the population perceives the country. Few, very few see their economy as going well. In Brazil, only 13% and 87% think the current situation in the country is really bad. Where economic views are worsening, current economy, uh, current economy is good. Look at Brazil over there. In 2014, 32% of Brazilians thought that the economy was okay. In 2015, 13% think that the economy is okay in Brazil. Um, the perception of the crisis, I think, and I think I should acknowledge that, also has a lot to do with the figure of the president. First thing, we're talking about words and about using the word crisis, for instance. Since day one of her first term, she has to be called presidenta the female way of using the world. We don't have this word in Portuguese, and we don't have it because we never had a president. We've always had because presidents. The word, doesn't exist. the word doesn't exist, and that's the beauty of language, in my opinion. It keeps changing and evolving, right? We already have the word selfies in the dictionaries, because now we created selfies, but we still don't have the word president. <coughs> and the media actually agreed that we would not create a word because now we have a woman who is a president. So she was, she's still called a, a presidente in the masculine, or neutral gender word. Well, it's up to you, but it's a fact. Um, but the idea that, the, but I wanted to talk about how uh, her personality also affects the perception of her figure. She's a, 
a, a woman and she's a very, very tough woman. The first time I met her was in 2004. She was still the Minister of Mines and Energy under President Lula. And uh, we were a bunch of journalists trying to interview her. I was really very young and uh, very energetic and wanted to make questions. And I had a minister in my city ready to interview her. And uh, Globo is a very big TV network in Brazil. So normally, we jump first and we do the first question. And uh, sometimes, especially when our, there are television. So I jumped there and I did the first question. And then I remained silent so that my friends could ask uh, uh, questions. And no one, I think people were so intimidated by her figure. She's a very, very intimidated person that they were like silent. And wow. she and she, everybody was staring at, at each other. And I was like, what should I do? And I asked the second question. And then I stopped for a while and waited. And nobody had a question. And I'm like, I jumped and I asked the third question. And she said, shh, shh stop. Only the little girl here is going to keep asking questions. And I was like, I don't know if this is a compliment or it's an offense. But that's how Juma is. She has this professoral tone. She's always, and she has this professoral tone with her uh, staff as well. Many of them complain in her first years how hard it is to work with her. She's always like asking questions. And if you're questions, and if you're not ready to answer them, prepared to be humiliated. So this is also part of, in my opinion, a lack of political wiseness uh, on the part of uh, President Dilma that really complicates uh, her, her figure. Uh, social, so in terms of social media, this fight actually started before Dilma's current term. It started during the election. It, it was, for many Brazilians, uh, the worst and the ugliest election uh, campaign we had ever in history. It was really, really ugly. A campaign in which we were, uh, I was at least very impressed about how ugly we could get in both sides. Not, I'm not talking about right wing or left wing. I'm saying everyone, things got really ugly in, uh, in, in a sense that no one imagined. So this is because I thought this would be a family friendly environment. So I, I got the easy ones. But there are very, very disrespectful pictures of the president. There were very disrespectful pictures of Aesio Neves as well, the opposition candidate. But those pictures are still, you know, I, I got another one two days ago that I, I asked my husband, do you think I can show this in the lecture? And he said, yeah. I don't think so. It's, they're, they're grown ups, but no, it's offensive. It's very offensive. And, uh, and it's something that I think, again, changes a little bit the perception we have of the person who is leading the nation and was elected to do that. This is another event. Uh, uh, this was a, uh, used for when you're fueling your tank, the tank of your car. This was like, uh, they, they would post it and uh, what? Like a sticker, sticker. Yeah, like a oh. sticker, but they would, I don't know how you call the hole of the fuel, the fuel tank. Yeah, the hole and the fuel tank would be there, and uh, that's how you fuel your car. And it was very polemic. I don't want to say that this is something that everybody was using in Brazil, but it was being sold online, and it was very polemic, and uh, there was a suit, and they stopped selling it. But that's how, when I, when I say ugly, I wanted to bring this to you for you to know what I'm talking about. Things are really getting ugly. And, uh, and this is something that I wanted to bring, the real one, but the, the entire uh, uh, graph, but I wasn't able to do that. So just for you to take a look, the moments when the red uh, uh, color and the red dot there is really like gaining strength are the days of demonstrations in Brazil. <coughs> that to say that all, practically all the demonstrations, those supported, uh, supporting the government and those criticizing the government were organized via social media. Facebook, WhatsApp, all these uh, uh, different instruments and different social medias gave the tone of the demonstrations in Brazil and were the source, the tool to organize these huge movements in Brazil. Again, as my friend said before, very hard for us to claim that, you know, we know who was there, but it's very hard for us to claim that, like, my mom was scared of a coup 
according to my friends who were in demonstrations and who are in Brazil now, I live in New York, I don't have the same sense that they have, it would be something around 1% of the population saying Dilma, Lula, the PT, no one, Giseu, no one has done anything ever, they're amazing, their sense, they should be canonized like 1% of the population. The, the, the big core of the population, even the left wing in Brazil, knows that there are problems and though they should be debated. And they also measured that like 1% claims that there should be a coup and only the military could solve this. But it doesn't matter if it's 1, 5, 10%. I don't have the numbers. No one has. The thing is that these groups are very vocal groups, especially in social media. So the impact in the perception the country has of the current situation is huge. Even this, my mom is not crazy when she says a new coup is, might happen. It's because this, uh, this scare, the perception of how frightening the situation is, is there. By the way, I just read Huffington Post published a few hours ago. Uh, uh, the, the leader of the national movement, Brasil Livre, it's one of the main movements of opposition to Dilma's government and organizing demonstrations online, just said that they're, they're shifting and Brazilians don't want her impeachment anymore. They're focusing on other problems. It's very hard for us to tell, and the agendas of this group as well, as Silvia said, are not very clear, so they're changing every time. It's, it seems that from today on, it's not the impeachment anymore. It's something else. Uh, Many of those demonstrations, it's very interesting how in, in many of them, Brazilians were using words in English. It's pretty intriguing. And uh, again, it might be 1% or 10% of the population afraid of communism back in Brazil. I don't think this is the tone of the opposition. But it's pretty intriguing that they are using words in English. It's very hard for us to tell what this exactly it means, but it can also indicate that there is a conscience that social media is a worldwide thing. And whatever they post there, it's going to be published all over the world, so they want to be clear. But there can be also something of you know detachment of what uh, the country currently is. Uh, here are some of the words that were the most common words in tweets uh, that had to do with Fora Dilma. It's a hashtag calling for Dilma's, uh, uh, being, Dilma being out of the, the, the government, ousted. Uh, and the, word, the most frequent words were Dilma, PT, and Lula too. Lula being very involved uh, and very referred to. These are just a few of those groups for you to see how huge the impact of them uh, is. In the day of the demonstration, actually, if we sum up the numbers of likes in the three main groups of opposition to the government, it reached 1.5 million likes just in one day, just a few hours when the demonstration starts. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very powerful uh, group. And we also see things like little uh, individuals showing uh, their opposition to the government. This guy here is uh, from the Polícia Federal, from the Brazilian equivalent to FBI, and he posted a picture saying he was training with Dilma Rousseff's picture, uh, shooting on her that his training was becoming, was now really easy because he had this inspiration. And uh, there, were, there was no punishment, which on one hand is may be disappointing uh, if we think of the United States or Gary Stein, for instance, with President Obama. We all remember that there was a punishment. And in this case, I think the punishment was three days uh, at home or something like that. But, but at the same time, it also demonstrates that institutions are working in Brazil and that he's from the Polícia Federal and he's posting on Facebook whatever he wants. And you, know, you can claim that both things are happening. He's free to, to give his opinion. And another thing, when we talk about words and the choice of words, this was also something that went viral, was a video, and I, o I only brought one picture uh, with a collection of um, news in Brazil. Uh, the, the expression, apesar da crise, is something like, despite the crisis, this and this and this. And, uh, and it's very funny because I'm a journalist and I'm writing every day, and, uh, and I do that too. You know, every once in a while, you catch yourself doing that because this is the current moment, and you, as a journalist, have to has, have to contextualize what's going on and and maybe create a mood for the news to be broadcast for a reason. Like if you come to me and you say, "I want to be in your show," I'm a very nice person and I have a lot to say. I'm like, "Yeah, but what is the hook? 
what am I going to tell about you? What are you doing now? What is the impact of what you're saying on something in the world, some event? So this despite the crisis is something that we've been using all the time. And if you watch the video, it's like 9, 14 minutes, something like It's a very, very long video with only like, apesar da crise, despite the crisis, despite the crisis. So even the good news are always followed by the word crisis. So even when you're saying uh, movie theaters in the country are, have, are, are doing great and had never been doing so well in four years despite the crisis. Uh, Brazilians are still traveling to the United States and spending a lot and are like the number one tourists in New York still despite the crisis. And uh, Brazil and despite the, you know, everything is despite the crisis. Yeah. So I wonder what is the impact that the word crisis, uh, even when you're telling good news, would have. And, uh, and that's it. That's, I wanted to that's what I wanted to talk about, perceptions. And I hope your perceptions are uh, in tone <laughs> or not with what I said. Thank you. OK, uh, Professor Green is telling me here that I have 15 or 25 minutes. <laughs> 15 minutes. I'm not going to have a splashy presentation like they had. This is not, uh, I feel like I'm the interloper here, the people who know me know that uh, I work on colonial uh, societies. I'm not going to even say colonial Brazil, colonial societies. And I, my focus is really on Africa. But I am Brazilian, which means that every day, the first thing I do in the morning is to read the Brazilian newspapers. And I go to Brazil, too, at least once a year. I get to hang out in Brazil. And when I go to Brazil, I go to uh, what I will call a working class neighborhood, so which gives me a sense of what's going on on the ground. And what is so amazing is the, what I'm going to call this schizophrenia, because the people who benefit the most from the social programs are the people turning against the government. So every year I go to Brazil, over the past two years, particularly, I have been uh, noticing this uh, process, this, um, um, you know, this uh, alienation or this sense of not being able to relate to the government anymore. But I'm going to uh, offer three ways to look at this. And uh, I'm very systematic. So I'm going to do this on a political level, on a social level. But the first one is really the international level. I'm going to be moving from what I think is the easiest way to understand what's really a very messy and fluid situation to what, in my view, is more complex, more intriguing, and more difficult to really uh, tease out. Um, so the first point, which to me is easy to, to get a good uh, understand, uh, or to make sense of it, is what I'm calling this international to look at Brazil in the broader context you know, of Latin America. And uh, a lot of what I'm doing here is what people have done. So that's the disadvantage of being the last one. <laughs> and they did that much better than I will do, okay? and particularly referring to Sylvia. Okay? She was placing this crisis, and she was describing it as a crisis of citizenship on a global level. I was going to place it in the Latin American level essentially to make the point that if you do that, then you have to realize that it's not only Brazil, you're going to find problems everywhere, not everywhere, but some key players in Latin America. And by that, I mean Argentina and Chile, Mexico too. So which begs the question, what's, what's really going on here? And in my humble opinion, I'm not the economist here, but I bet if you had an economist here, the economists would say that there is a, an exhaustion of a model of you know, economic development going on here. In other words, too much reliance on China, perhaps, you know, stuff that for very few people several years ago, it looked like it would not work. And guess what? It is not working because this reliance means that once the Chinese economy I'm not going to say that it's collapsing or going down, but once it, once it slows down, inevitably, you're going to have an impact on Brazil. So this is a country that four years ago, five years ago, everybody was talking about the pre-sal. Remember that? 
We were going to tap into the pre sow and then we we're going to explain his oil deposits. The oil deposits off the, uh, the, the, the coast of Brazil, offshore deposits. And uh, I don't even remember anymore how much, but there is a lot there. <laughs> so, um, and the deal, the implicit uh, suggestion was that, never really spelled out, was that we're going to sell all this stuff to China, right? They need that. There is a, an insatiable demand for commodities there. So, and this doesn't work. That's essentially the takeaway point, the point I'm trying to make. The PT, the PT government, as it put together, as it sought to develop the Brazilian economy, make a choice that's not working anymore. Okay? Needless to say, the point that I'm making is that it would have made more sense to invest in a, you know, creating a more solid industrial basis for the country. That's my point. The polit political level, I see two, two issues at play here, many, okay? But I see two that stands out to me. The first, uh, there is a fatigue with this, you know, how many years of PT government? And that's me trying to relate to the conservative uh, segment of the, the population, try to understand where they are coming from, okay? Not, not being so suspicious of their rationale. And I can understand that. So there is an argument to be made about the need to, for rotation here when it comes to, to power. Um, another point that's a, a little bit of a logical extension of this point is if we look at the the last elections, the difference between S and Dilma was just like 3%. Yeah. So it pretty much paves the way for, in a way, to what's going on now. There was an opposition there. Do you know what I mean? So there is this sense of fatigue that's building up, and we can tell that, you know, over time. Now, another point that's interesting, if you break it down the way I'm suggesting here, okay, and it is artificial, okay, I'm the first one to acknowledge that. When it comes to the political level, there is a lot of frustration. Okay, that is, okay, that is, that is fatigue on the right side, okay, on the right wings, but there is a lot of frustration when it comes to the progressive side. And the frustration is because PT, or the PT government, was never, doesn't live up to the ideals of PT. So on one hand, you are too conservative, you're bringing communism into Brazil, but on the other hand, you are not, that is not, is not as progressive as people would like. This is consequential because once this uh, critique kicks in, it is at that point in time that we see people breaking off from PT. We see the formation of uh, other parties. And this is meaningful because when it comes to these protests, the people who could be there on the streets defending the government, they are the people who can no longer relate to the government, not because the government is a communist government, quote unquote, but because the government is not living up to the ideals of the left. So just two points here. And the, the third point, um, which is the social level, okay? This is the most intriguing and complex for me. Um, I would actually take issue with the idea that there is social unrest in Brazil. To me, the system, to some extent, is working. So I don't understand the title that we use it here, social unrest. It, it, it gives a sense that, you know, uh, this is the Titanic, I mean, you know, it's collapsing the system, I, I don't know. But to go back to, to my point, okay, um, the irony here is uh, 20 years ago, PT was a dream from academia, right? I remember going into the shanty towns in, 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 in Rio people would never even look at us, the poor people that we wanted to relate to. So it was like the support would come from intellectuals, okay, from the elite, from people from the Zona Sul of Rio, and in my case, I grew up in Rio. The people that they wanted to relate to, they, they didn't care about PT. Now we are back to that situation. 
because everybody is against PT. The, the working class is against PT. Um, but the irony is that the real support is coming at this critical juncture, is coming from Brazilian capitalists. And I, I, that is an irony here that I find it jaw dropping, you know. Um, why do they do that? Because they don't want the disruption. Okay? They think that what if Dilma is gone, what's gonna come next? So they, they, don't like the, they don't like the unrest. That's gonna be real unrest from their point of view. This is the viewpoint or the vantage point of the elite. Now, on this social level, if we look at what's going on on the ground, I see a backlash against the government. Okay? This is very anecdotal. Okay? I'm not a sociologist, I'm not a political science, but I see a lot of that going on. The middle class um, turned it against the government in a way that made me think about the importance, the symbolic power of Petrobras, the Brazil, Brazilian oil company. So the idea that you know, the government is, is, is undercutting, is destroying Petrobras, it, it, it is something that really upsets people, the middle class. Right? Now, the middle class has a hard time to accept this, some of the progressive policies of PT. Apparently, the number of uh, maids that would sleep at the, at, the, at the house of the people they would be working for was like 25% some years ago, and now it's down to 2%. So, in, you know what I mean? The, you are enfranchising people, you are empowering people, you are, and, and this is causing, okay, in my opinion, some degree of backlash. Okay. Uh, for people who travel in Brazil, if you get on a plane in, in Brazil now, I mean, it is, it is amazing. I mean, if I, when I travel internationally, I'm, I always stand out, okay? I'm always quiet. I eat all the food because you want to fit in, right? In Brazil, you see the, the people, the working class, they can take these flights, they can travel by plane. And this is my view on this, is that, you know, there is something here by introducing, by making that available to people that, you know, upsets the system. That's my point. Needless to say, my view about the society is that it is extremely conservative at the bottom yeah, and beyond the bottom. Yeah. Um, now, there's still a lot to be said on this. I'm leaving lots of gaps here. Perhaps we can fill them in later. Uh, but the working class, this is really the thing that I was extremely intrigued about that. I mean, the people who get to go to these uh, new universities, the public universities. They get the fellowships, they get the grants, they get to travel on the planes. I mean, that's a big deal, right? But yet, they, they cannot, they, they don't support the government. They are, they're gonna be the people using the so social media to circulate those despicable images of the president which really is, is really jaw-dropping, shocking once you see that. So what's, what's going on there? And I don't know how, how well I'm doing in terms of time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna suggest something that, you know, a lot of what I've been saying has been said in a much better way, laid out in a much more persuasive way. But there is something that was missing there, okay? And, and you guys are the specialists, I'm not, okay? You ask me about 18th century Brazil or the uh, Portuguese empire, I know about that. <laughs> but I, I, I was missing something there, which is the impact of these evangelical forces in society and how that manifests itself on several levels in terms of politics, but not only in terms of politics, also the, how they organize themselves using, uh, what's the name, I, I'm not, computer savvy at that level, but uh, using Facebook, using Twitter, using WhatsApp, and all sorts of means to, you know, to, to spread 
this view of the government that's very negative. And um, I mentioned to you all, and I'm going to use this to wrap this up, that this all comes from me going to these neighborhoods and talking to people and essentially talking to people from my family, you know, and, and seeing how they relate to the government and how much of their view is shaped by the churches that they go to, which are these evangelical churches. So that's why, for me, that's perhaps there is a, there is a link there. Okay? But I have to confess that my sample, I'm, not, I'm no sociologist, so it's not really a large sample. Okay? But that's, that's so um, what we're going to do is I'm going to call on five people to speak, ask a question. I'm going to ask people not to do 15-minute interventions because we want to really share the opportunities to ask questions or make comments. So can we try to be concise? And then I'll let anyone on the panel who wants to comment on those comments to say something, and then we'll go for a second round and a third round until we decide it's, it, we've exhausted ourselves. So I will take five questions. So just raise your hand, and I'll call Adam and Ben and Andre and, and I can't see Amy. 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 I can't see if I've got, yeah, and a fifth person, just so we close it up. OK, we'll take four. <laughs> So I don't know about the prevalence of these trends in Brazil itself. I just noticed reports in Western media that I read frequently. But there has been increasing attention towards the police pacification units in the favelas and the level of violence there, especially as the police tend to interfere with the local order that's been structured by the drug cartels. And I want to know if that community violence, um, the violence in the favelas and the community organizing that's been raised to protest against police involvement and against the drug cartels, how that fits into the larger social instability caused by the political crisis and economic crisis. Ben? Uh, this is a question about the political parties. Um, seeing as, as Moises pointed out very importantly that the two main parties are officially center-left parties, um, do any of you think that it would be feasible to have a not center-left party or you know, something more like the American Democrats or a more hard liberal type party in Brazil? Or do you think that the overall social values would be described as center-left? Like that things maybe skew a little more left, economically at least. Andre. Uh, my question is also about parties. One of the things that strikes me in the coverage of the crisis in Brazil is that the PT is treated as something anomalous, that it's kind of, it exists almost outside the political system, that it's uniquely power hungry, that it's uniquely corrupt, um, and which to me seems wrong, right? Like the, the, the charge, the PT, does anything stay in power? As if the PSDB would pass up an opportunity if they had a chance to win an election. So I, I just, I guess to comment a little bit on the historical specificity of the PT, its trajectory, which I think is unique, but also where it is today, which I think is not particularly unique compared to other parties. And in the back. Yes. First, thank you to all panelists. This was really terrific. Um, I'm not from Brazil. I don't have most of my family in Brazil. So when I get to hear about Brazil, it's very often through the Brazil Institute here. And I noticed the striking paradox between all the terrific scholars which we've had here um, for Doss in the past year, Fred Hogan talking about parties becoming more programmatic, um, Jose Chavubi saying that now parties coordinate more for the list for elections. And this is really a striking contrast with the talk today, which you know, attracted quite a bit of people talking about social and political unrest and really a sense of crisis. And well, I'm wondering what your thoughts on that are in general, and more specifically, you know, to what extent this is just kind of Brazil being a victim of its own success, or um, you know, if this is something you would actually expect as a product of the institutionalization of politics in the last decades in Brazil. Um, Mila Burns, I really like this idea that maybe we're using this crisis as a brand or because it sells and so forth. Um, and then back to the parties, I know it seems to interest a lot of people, Moises, maybe we could talk um, more about that, but I mean, you have two center-left parties that are occupying most of the global scenes, but that's what Downs and, Downs and sorry, theories of, of electoral competition would tell you. You'll have these parties converging, becoming casual parties. You have great scholarship on how the PT became um, the casual parties, and maybe that's just you know, what they cater to now, they're capturing most of the electorate. And yes, of course, they're frustrating both of the extreme on the left 
and on the right, and maybe you'll be relying on those parties and so forth, but you know, maybe that's what we would expect somehow. Okay, so I'm going to let any of the panelists comment if they want to in any order, and then we'll open up another round. I yeah, sure. have a few comments about the, especially the, the, the party system. So, uh, so the, the two questions, right, about, about the party system. Yes, there is no, uh, there are very small parties to the right, but they haven't been able to be very successful, and I think it's because of how these two parties have uh, 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 been formed. But the interesting thing, though, is that the popular perception of the party system is that PSDB is a rightist party. And I think Mila talked a lot about this, about the left and the right, right? When there's no right in the system. But we think about the left and the right as about PT being the left and PSDB being the right. And they they're very much are not, right? They're both very much to the center left, and they'll recognize this. But I think there is a, uh, an interesting way about this uniqueness, which is uh, about their history, the history of these parties. Right, so they, they all came from the struggle against the, the military dictatorship, and you have the PMDB as was the party during the dictatorship that was opposed to the to the arena, the, 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 the military regime's party, and their only platform was really democracy. That was all they stood for, and that's why we see today that they really don't stand for anything because their uh, 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 right their their claim is, is is already there, and then you have the PT that was. Uh, a mix of a group of uh, leftists, a group of revolutionaries, and the Catholic Church support as well. And that really kind of made it complicated to define what the party was all about. And that, I think, turns out to how politics is played today. And then the PSDB, which came out as an offshoot from the PMDB, that saw the democracy was not all it mattered anymore, and they actually had a social democratic program for how to go forward with the economy, how the government uh, uh, worked. Now, because of that, I think it changes their attitudes. But on the class issues, which is what politics has been played on, uh, uh, it, it's been very similar because of that. Now, as I said, there's those two parties that are, there's obviously demand for them, otherwise they would not exist, right? But the biggest problem is that I think there are lots of other interests that want to be represented in society. But the party system as it is established today does not allow them to actually enter into the system. Right? So earlier this year, we had a big uh, uh, discussion about uh, political reform in Brazil that wanted to change the electoral rules in Brazil. That changed, there, uh, there was a, a big chunk of the population wanted to make uh, voto distrital, which is right, a majoritarian uh, uh, system, much like the U.S., to divide the country into different districts, and every district just votes for one person, which would force it for less parties and more uh, uh, party identification. So that was one of the proposals. The other one was a larger threshold, so very small parties could not be in the system. So that was something that was voted on. And there was a lot of support for some of these, some for, for these measures. But because the system actually helps the incumbent parties, then there is no political will to actually push them forward. right? And there's actually now a big discussion about bringing parliamentarism back into Brazil. And this is actually a, a very real discussion. So this is not just you know, rumors. Uh, I spent a lot of time in Congress last year, and across all parties, with the exception of the PT, people were talking about, yes, parliamentarism would be a better option, exactly because you need a responsible government, right? So if government's not doing well in the case it is now, you can actually uh, take it down. And then parties can actually be a little bit more fluid. They can actually attend to the demands of the population. So we talked a little bit about, uh, right, the evangelical movement. And I think there's a large population that wants that, but it's in conflict with some of the other ideologies from these other parties, and it becomes a, a, a complicated relationship uh, uh, within the system. Okay. Oh, thank you. Anyone else yeah. want to speak? I, I'm going to yeah, comment it's, also. It's 20, 28 parties in Congress today in Brazil. So it's, it's really what Fernando Henrique Cardoso called a model of ungovernability. It's really something that's it's, it's pressing. And, um, and I think that political reform in Brazil, as you, as you said, is something that has been debated for quite some time and no one is able to finally deliver it. I just wanted to address Andrea's question because I think it's, it's a very interesting point. I always keep thinking of that and it's very hard to answer because whatever you say, you're taking sides. But, but I think that there's uh, some very clear, and I can claim that they're right wing, like Paulo Malufi, uh, 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 older school, old school gov uh, uh, politicians in Brazil that had famous uh, uh, sayings like "Roba mais faz" or "Yeah, uh, demais barros," and other famous politicians that used slangs that suggested something like 
it's okay if we still, but we're still doing things. Or in Brazil, it's always been like that. There's nothing different from that. And I think that the left wing, PSD, BPT, whoever you're calling, has always pointed to that as a real, really problematic thing. So it's very hard also for for PT today to say, oh, it's okay, it's always been there if for so long. PT has been pointing to all these problems, I think. So um, I want to, I was trained as a political scientist uh, and then became an historian because there was much more that we could look at and study. Um, <laughs> and I follow very closely. The first thing I read is Folha. I really wanted to show an image that is just the most revolting. It, Folha de São Paulo is like the New York Times on their opinion page has an offensive picture of a nude Jilma uh, prone, right? Do you know what I'm talking about in Folha? Yeah, yeah. That is there every day. It's like, it would be like showing, I don't know, Hillary prone? or I just, It's just shocking that the latest paper, so that's the, this is shocking. So one of the problems I think in Brazil, which is mentioned, is that all of the major newspapers, all of them, have the same viewpoint which is very critical of the government and has been very critical of the government and there's no print media or legitimized news channel or media outlets which is offering what I would call a center left position so that's the first point I want to make and no one's crazy enough to try to found a new newspaper today so the, the only way you can do that is through the problems of social media that don't have the legitimacy as, as uh, about newspapers but I would really disagree with Moises. He's a political scientist and studies this more. But I think that we until <laughs> last year, we could easily say, and I think my statistics will prove this. I'll have to do the research to make sure I'm not making up statistics. But approximately, even during the military regime, but at least since, since 1946, about a third of the population voted center-left very consciously either in the Communist Party or the PTB, which is a Labor Party, or the Socialist Party, and thought of themselves in those terms. A third of the population was basically in the center, voting parties traditionally like the PSDB, the PS, uh, PS, PS, PSD, the Democratic Social Party, they changed their name so many times it's confusing. Uh, and then another third, or less than a third, voted a hard right, which was before the dictatorship, the UDN became the Arena, and after that became a series of political parties that were marginalized because of the popular democratic movement to democratize the country and the silencing of any discussion of a military intervention until two years ago. In the 50th anniversary of the military coup, I went to Sao Paulo, where it was the center of the coup 50 years before that, to Praça da República. There was a called for demonstration. There were 100 demonstrators, and there were 200 people in the media following the 100 demonstrators. It was absolutely the most marginal thing in the world to call for the military to, to intervene in the government. <coughs> a year later, that's a reality. And I agree with Mila. It's not that there are 20 or 30 percent of the population or 10 percent, even 5 percent of the demonstrators against the government which are in favor of military intervention. But clearly, the fear and the discourse around that, which was taboo, is now legitimized. So why do I still think that unless there's going to be a total reorganization ideologically and politically, that we still are in the third, third, third. And in that regard, I, in my presentation, called Fernando Cardoso's coalition on the people he has supported is center-right. Because in the final vote in a, an election where there's a runoff for the two top candidates, you build coalitions. And the people who were in the coalition that supported Ayrcio Neves, supported José Serra, supported Alckmin, supported José Serra supported, I can't, I'm not going to be able to remember that right order, the candidates of what I call the center right, was a, com a co coalition of parties from the very far right to the middle of the road. And then L Lula composed another coalition, which was contradictory because it had some very conservative forces in it, but was generally center left. And the differences are complicated because the PT did have at one time a much clearer ideological perspective of social redistribution, state development of the economy. But Lula, a long time ago, as a person who knew how to negotiate with multinational automobile companies, was enamored by the power of capitalism and, and big business. And the PT has abandoned a socialist vision that it has. It is a party that believes in capitalism, a kind of capitalism once stored with the state. So you have business people supporting the PT. And Fernando Cardoso, although was a social democrat and was um, uh, s suffered from the repression of the regime, 
ended up building a, a new perspective in his later years, and he was at, here at Brown for five years, and I talked to him a lot, which believes much more in a kind of social democracy which is intimately linked to foreign capital, which wants to ultimately reduce the role of the state and social benefits and social programs, thinking this is a better way to go forward. So it's a kind of social democracy, diff but it's a conservative social democracy on this spectrum. But because these coalitions are crazy, because you need a certain number of people to get anything passed in Congress, and you need to offer support through ministries in order to get people to support you in the election voting for the runoffs of the presidential election, you have horribly strange bedfellows in the two coalitions. And then people on the outsides, the PSOL, uh, other political parties to the left, on the critique from the left, and then you have other people who are on the margin from the right. So we can disagree on that. I just wanted to offer a different voice because I think it's not ju it's not just a given that there's two central left parties and it's the PS and the Bay and it's the PT. And we, you know, you don't have to agree with me, but I wanted to put that out there. So um, we can take another round, and we have Paula and yeah. Did any? Oh, I did anyone want to answer that question that Adam uh, asked? Or I mean, I don't know if I'll answer, answer but I think. Political uh, police violence uh, is a serious issue. Um, how do you say chassis in a slaughter? Massacre. 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 Yes. There have been serious uh, massacres these years. They have not been in the media or didn't receive the amount of attention it deserved, and they went unpunished. Like the police officers, they were just suspended and they're not being really prosecuted. So I think. Violence in society is a huge issue, and I talk about some of the laws, and I think this is linked to what Hokinaldo was saying about the evangelical presence. Not that the evangelical presence in itself is a problem, but they are trying to push a very conserv conservative agenda in a secular state. For example, we have Bolsonaro with tons of followers, and as a candidate for the um, to be a mayor of Rio de Janeiro, which is an important city, someone that publicly said to a woman, Maria do Rosário, that he wouldn't rape her because she didn't deserve. Uh, then we have Malafaia, too, with this, this huge power in Brazil. He's a pastor, uh, president of the Assembleia de Deus. And then we have like something even more crazy, like Dilma going to the Assembleia de Deus to try to gain uh, support from the evangelicals. Another, uh, the other candidate of, for the, to be the mayor of Rio de Janeiro too has a history of violence against women. And then we had the Enem, which I mentioned, that caused a huge reaction. Enem is, um, is um, an essay, like the essay is here. And this year they had as the theme of the essay for students to write violence against women. And they had some questions about Simone de Beauvoir's uh, work. And then we had Bolsonaro and other people releasing notes saying how this was indoctrination uh, from the state. So when violence against women become a topic from the left, is categorized as a problem of the left-wing parties, I think we had a huge like ethical problem in our society. Um, so yeah, I think this is all. So linked. I think to add, maybe to answer, unless someone else wants to talk about it, the, the, the violence is continuing, the economic crisis is deepening that. Uh, the police responses have been uh, unsatisfactory, problematic. They've been successful in some places and unsuccessful in others. And this is not a problem that's been solved, although there have been lots of attempts to do it recently. There's no rosy picture I think we can say. I and just wanted to add that I think it also offers an interesting debate. I never thought of that, but now I'm thinking it could be an interesting research because the UPP is something on the state level. And it also offers a discussion of the layers of federalism in Brazil, actually. It's uh, uh, the economic crisis and, uh, uh, the, and violence in Brazil are not perceived as, some, as something that is, you know, dependent on the state or on the federal government. It's something that affects everyone's lives. But when it comes to uh, acting and, and doing something about that, it, this division of, powers, of power in Brazil is something that is really tricky and intriguing, something that should be done by the states and not by the federal government. So I don't know to what extent this really affects the crisis, but again, if we're talking about perception, yeah. Just a quick note on this. The New York Times has an article today on this. That's what I was referencing. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I, and the argument that which makes a lot of sense is why do we have a conversation about these issues in the U.S. and in Brazil where the situation is how many times worse? No one really talks about that. Mm -hmm. You know, in a way it has to do with the fact that the federal government cannot do much about it, but there are other issues at play here, too. You know what I mean? A society that yeah. accepts that level of violence 
and who is being targeted by the violence. Sure. But, but, but the issue is discussed in politics, and we actually heard, so Siva talked about, right, one of the, 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 the projects of all was to decrease the majority uh, uh, age to actually going to jail, right? So th this is actually something that the right would be discussing, right? And exactly because we don't have a rightist party that actually have voice for that, it's not seriously discussed. So the, the people that have voices, it's like Bolsonaro, for example, right? The one that Siva just ridicularized, and a lot of the population do that. There's actually people that are interested in that, but because politics is not fought on those terms, right, that's not a relevant political issue, then it becomes out irrelevant for the, for the political debate. But there's actually people that do want to, uh, so also against uh, uh, gun control laws, that's something that has been uh, uh, discussed in the past, but because it doesn't buy votes, exactly because of how the parties are distributed and more issues are actually relevant for them. Let's take another round. We have Paula and any other people. And if we don't, we'll have a final round, and that's I it. Have a question going going once, going twice. Another question. Any other questions? We don't want to. People have to go home and study and read for class for tomorrow. I have a question for Mila. Okay, so <laughs> let's take those three questions and any comments, and then we'll end the evening. So Paula, and a second question, and then uh, Sylvia. Okay, thank you everyone for speaking. This is great. Um, so I have a question that's more about like the cultural sort of background to all of this that's going on. So, um, and this is my perception also through social media in Brazil. I'm also from Brazil, but I live here, so most of what I'm seeing is what I'm seeing on social media. And like the question is, is does that reflect reality or is it just like completely out of proportion? And probably the latter. But there seems to be a backlash on social media against the issue of minority rights. And so in cases of like affirmative action, uh, racial photos, for instance, uh, efforts against sexism and violence against women, acceptance of LGBT communities and other issues. And there is this general public discourse that people are upset that they are living in a dictatorship of political correctedness, where they can't make the same jokes that they used to anymore. Uh, and all of that is very prominent with especially comedians and all of that. Um, and I was wondering, you know, if this can, uh, does this signal a larger change in sort of Brazilian political culture and how these minority rights are being sort of included in the repertoire of people's sort of everyday interactions with each other? Or are these just prejudices? I mean, it seems like the prejudice is very directly um, expressed in social media. Like, you know, there's a many recent um, cases of open racism in Facebook, for instance, of like famous or non-famous, of course, uh, people. And this seems to be like sort of a change in the general understanding of Brazil as sort of this place where racial inequality exists, uh, is very stark, but it's sort of like under the surface and not very much expressed. So I was like, is this just, you know, an emergence of these pre-existing tensions that were always there, or is social media somehow in this whole climate of change that's going on um, sort of changing the way in which people are thinking about these issues? There was another, yeah. Um, question is uh, a little twofold. The first one is I would Speak like louder. To, I'd like to know what, what your opinions are about the new party, the Partido Novo. And uh, because to me, it just sounds like as if all the the one percent decided to make their own party. <laughs> and uh, now they, they don't want like they don't want some kind of middleman anymore. They want to be there. Like they are in the floor already, but they, they're not just casting the votes, but now they want it. And uh, the second part is uh, the fact that I disagree with Moises when he says that Bolsonaro is talking about, you know, the the legal age, like the, the, the majority, like for you to for you to go to jail, right? Uh, that when he says that Bolsonaro is the only one talking about it because no one else is, I think it's untrue. Especially because Bolsonaro is a former military and he's actually advocating the legalization of killing minors. He isn't trying to solve the problem. What he's trying to do is to make it legal to persecute the miners. At least that's the way I see it. And uh, I would like to have more input on that affirmation, that no one's talking about violence against minors, and against specifically black, and that's why he's doing it. There was a th oh, yes, you want to ask a question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, pick back here on Paula's comment, um, and in a question to Mila. You talk about perception and what I would like you to talk a little bit more about is reality versus public opinion because you said, for example, you showed us uh, statistics of how people think the economy is doing bad. But like, how, how many of those people know who to blame or do they know who is the source of the problem? Because I think this relates to the question that Andre um, asked. 
I feel like a lot of this crisis is built on the frustration of expectations. So we had the success of Lula's government, and then Dilma's first uh, term, and then she did not deliver what people expected. So I feel like it's easy to turn, and the media, I feel the media does that. I would like to, to talk about this. It's easy to blame Dilma for everything. Um, and also, what do you think of the fact, for example, what would be the solution for this? Because I feel the media intensifies, increases the crisis, but in Brazil, the all the media, like the big, the big, the big media is owned by five families. And there's a lot of nepotism. And there's not like something like here in the US where there can't be cross property. For example, Newsweek is not allowed to own a TV program or to have a radio station. In Brazil, this doesn't happen. All the media is owned by the same family, the same people. So I don't think violence for, it's not that the, Brazi the Brazilian society doesn't care as much for the violence for Bolsonaro, et etc. I just feel the media is not offering people the information they could have and then to deal with it. Good. So we have final comments, and uh, any panelists would like to speak? Um, well, I would like to say something. Yeah, yeah. Okay, but you can speak first, please. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, I've never asked the question uh, uh, directly. So I'm I'm not saying that what Bolsonaro is doing is with a specific intent. What I'm saying is that the debate is actually there. It just doesn't get much traction, right? So politically, it's not something that buys them any votes, and it's doesn't make any any popular. And he's actually a person that's actually been able to explore that in a way that he's actually comes into evidence, right? A politician that probably will not get any support exactly because how the party system works, is actually able to capitalize on something that population is actually thinking a lot about and makes some <coughs> absurd comments and then he gets a lot of traction, right? And he will probably be reelected because he's doing that, right? Just because of how the structure of the party system works. Again, I think that's uh, the, the heart of the problem. <coughs> and the Partido Novo, I, I think that we'll see in the next election whether or not it's 1% of the population or not. I think it's not. I think there is a large portion of the population that actually wants that. Uh, that, that wants uh, protection of private property, that wants uh, uh, smaller government. I think there is a lot of people, and during the, the protests, a lot of people are actually asking for that, right? So it's a voice that before was a little bit of a taboo to say it, but now there's space for them to, to say that, and if they're able to form a party. Now, for you to form a party in Brazil, it's no small uh, 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 business. You need to have 500,000 signatures, and these are recognized, right? So it has to, these people have to exist, and there's a a very hard process for this to go through. I mean, Marina Silva discussed this when she was here, right? Her party pended uh, approval for years because she could not prove that those 500,000 signatures were there. And they were actually able to get it in much less time than Marina did, and she's a famous person, right? Uh, so there's obviously people that want to see that. Whether or not that's gonna buy enough votes to make a difference, we'll see in the coming elections. But I think it's, it's definitely gonna be a, 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 a player. Um, so, uh, to, to, to respond to Paula, um, some of you know that I was a founder of the gay rights movement in Brazil and I followed that very intensely. It was within the context of the democratization of the country when a women's movement emerged, a black consciousness movement emerged, an indigenous struggles movement emerged, and an LGBT movement emerged at the time. And it's been a really exciting 30 years because the issues that were so marginalized and so against the current really became national debates and questions. And the many, many victories were made for all of these movements in terms of affirmative action programs, a debate about racism, a debate about sexism and violence against women, a question about equality for gays and lesbians, and really tremendous movements in the indigenous, uh, the, the rights of indigenous peoples for their lands. And what I've seen in Brazil, when, when I came back to Brazil in the 90s to do doctoral research, I was telling my friends in the movement, watch out for the evangelicals. They're going to come to Brazil. They're going to copy what they did in the United States. You're in for a big slam, because this was a time in which the right wing was really attacking the gay rights movement in the United States. And everybody said, no, Brazil is not like that. People are not going to have that kind of ideology. The evangelicals are not really strong. And we now know that they're 24% of the population, mostly are extremely conservative on social issues, very powerfully politically, and have been sometimes smart in being in parties that we would call the left parties, but mostly in parties that are more conservative, and have brought a very seriously conservative agenda to Brazil, which is a rollback on all of these wonderful victories that have been achieved in the last 30 or 40 years. 
I think the political polarization that Moises and others have pointed out is a fact in Brazil like it is in the United States. And that's unusual because Brazil thinks of itself as a country where conciliação and amiability and cordiality are the natural nature of things, and so this seems to be a shock. But there's a d deep polarization in the country, and I think that polarization between the left and the right means that many victories, as in this country, that were seen as something that were guaranteed are being challenged by the right, as we see this in the primary elections in the United States, although I'm not sure they're going to be victorious. And so um, there was a big debate about the 1618 vote. I followed it on the internet uh, a lot. There were lots of people demanding that the age remain at 18 and others for 16 for many arguments, a lot of them around the racist implications of that law and the implications for youth. There have been serious debates about gun control and violence against people and Black Lives Matter in Brazil because they do. But we know that for many, many reasons, there's a silencing of that. It's not a priority of the big media and they call the agenda. TV Globo makes the <laughs> Jornal Nacional calls the agenda of what's discussed in the country. And 80%, 70% watch that news every night, and it's the way that shapes the news and inform information. And when they all of a sudden promote national demonstrations and tell you where to go to demonstrate, which they never did in Jireta Ja for democracy, but they're saying exactly where you need to go next Saturday for the, or the Sunday for the impeachment demonstration, you can see how the media is siding with one sector of society against another. They're very clearly interested at one point of bringing down the Jilma government. Now, I think there's a tremendous fear. And so new inventions, parties that, you, you know, we know how this works in this country. You can buy elections. You can uh, register 500,000 people if you have the money to pay people to do the registration. It can be legal and it can happen fast. And you can have a seemingly democratic organization of your party when, in fact, a certain core number of people run it. And Marina runs her party. And I respect her. It's not horizontal. It is vertical. And uh, you know, this is well known. And she is the person who makes the final decisions. Some of them come from God. Others come from her inspiration. <laughs> she says that. And that's how it happens. And I think the, the Novo Partido Novo will be a very interesting new development, which will, I think, not, it's, it's, it's not coming out of an anarcho-libertarian moment of the 70s that's saying, let's build a democratic party. I was in the PT when it was democratic, and I organized a democratic PT. It became something else later. This is not the moment, and Partido Novo is not going to be a horizontal democratic party with mass participation if the business community is running it. I wanted to end with one last thing. I am... Um, uh, go to Brazil and try to find what's going on at the time, and I went to talk to a very prominent empresario, a business person, and I acted like the dumb blonde American. What's going on? I don't understand what's going on. I said, problem is, it used to be 10%. All you needed is for any business deal, 10% it was solved. You had to pay the 10%, it was like a tax. And then Cola Gemello came in and he said, well, if 10% is the mean, I want more. And so he started asking for 15 and 20%. And then other people, people in the PT and others said, well, let's get more. And so there is a, uh, orgy, orgy of, of corruption going on. And we need to go back to the 10%, which is where things work, and that's how we want it to be. And so I think there's a sense we want to return to some normalcy that we can know how the rules of the game work and everyone can get their 10% and we can go on with business as usual. So I think that um, I will uh, claim the responsibility for the term crisis in our, our discussion. It was a way to get you here. You got here, it worked. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to especially thank Luis Valencia for being the person who kind of nudged us and said, make this yeah, happen, and being here. Basically quiet. And, and, and I'm amazed <laughs> that he did, <laughs> I'm amazed that he didn't decide to share his ideas, which are always uh, very insightful and uh, instigador. And uh, we we'll want to thank you all for coming. And uh, if Ramon can remind us of our next Brazil Initiative event. Uh, our next Brazil Initiative event is about um, the Middle East and Brazil. Trans-Regional Transnational Scholarship. It's Monday, November 16th at 4 p.m. And it's sponsored, co-sponsored with the Middle Eastern Studies. We invite you all to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, this wonderful panel.